title for this four-day series of seminars is Controversial Issues in Islam. We'll only cover some of them. There are many such issues. These are some difficult topics, some topics that we may not often discuss openly they could in some ways be discouraging and that's one reason why I'm bringing them out because we often see that devotees they come to Krishna consciousness and naturally Krishna consciousness is very enlightening but it's very common that devotees after some time of practicing Krishna consciousness start to see a difference between the ideal that is preached and the reality in which they are living. And sometimes the difference is quite stark and this can seriously affect their faith in the process of Krishna consciousness to the extent that they may not want to continue with it. So I'm going to discuss some topics which are quite prominent in our movement at the present time, although we may not be aware of most of them. If you're not aware, you'll probably come to be aware after some time. Um, the first... Yeah, so that's why I want to discuss it, so that... that uh, we can be aware, intelligently aware, aware of certain issues, so that we can be better equipped to face them and deal with them without being so much disturbed that we no longer feel to practice Krishna consciousness. Now the first topic I'm covering is institutionalization and ISKCON. What is institutionalization? Well, it means that, well, you'll get to find out more as we do, as we talk about it, but it means that starting to become uh, wrapped up in the rules and regulations of the institution, something like Niyamagraha, as Rupa Goswami says, more interested in following all the edicts of the institution without understand, without considering what is the purpose of the institution. Mm. So this isn't a controversial issue in and of itself, but it is the, we could say it's the background of many individual controversies that devotees get involved in difficulties in dealings between devotees, managerial expectations and individual expectations. We'll discuss it as we go on. It's well known that Karl Marx was one among several prominent thinkers of the modern age who lambasted religion, calling it the opiate of the people. He considered religion as a massive fabrication to cheat people. 
opiate, intoxication, when you, when you are intoxicated, then you tend, you can't see, you think you see things very clearly. But actually, our understanding is not clear at all, although we think it to be. So that's his example. That religion is being deliberately used as an intoxication, a deliberately fed intoxication to keep people in ignorance. People are told that this is the highest knowledge, but actually, according to Marx and others, it's simply a device to cheat people and exploit them. We also hear many people in the West say that, I don't believe in organized religion. With the idea that as soon as it gets organized, that someone's going to exploit someone else. So people, many people say, well, you should just have religion in your heart. And because as soon as it's organized, there's got to be some cheating. And the, in the Western world, the history of the Christian religion is, is marked by the, the division, at least in Western Europe, between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. Protestant means they protested against all the cheating going on in the name of religion. So, for instance, selling. People, if you want to get free from your sins, you have to pay so much money to the priest. Then he forgives you. Then you do some more sins. And with the money that the priest gets, he does some sins also. So, it was rejected by thoughtful people of the time. We said that the general Protestant approach is that we don't need anyone between us and God. We, got, we read the book, the Bible's there. We don't need any Pope, we don't need any priest. You read the Bible and you pray to God and that's it. That's uh, at the heart of the Protestant ethic. But they also got organized. <laughs> so, What's the fact? Is religion bad? Or is it good? Those who are religious, they say that well, this is the highest good and they speak in terms of, the, of very high ideals. Certainly the great figures who are the, after whom the religions are named Buddha. From Buddha we get Buddhists. From Jesus Christ we get Christians. Sometimes Islam, they're called Mohammedans because they follow Muhammad. So these these are the founders of these religions. So these were persons of high ideals who purported to have kim or, or higher perception by which people of the world could be benefited and generally it's accepted that these are saintly people. So, if these people are, these great religious leaders are so high in their ideals and have touched people's lives over many generations, then how is it that their followers are in so many cases considered to be so bad that they're simply exploiting others. How, do, how does that happen? That in the name of Jesus, Krishna, and Buddha, the followers who are saying their names are considered to be so bad by some. Well, I'll quote from Back to Godhead magazine here. 
because I want to quote a sociologist, so I'll, I'll say, it's quoted in Back to Godhead by Ravindra Saruprabhu, who declared himself to be a, this is tongue-in-cheek, tongue-in-cheek means, how do, you, how do you say that in ordinary English, a little sarcastically or not not exactly meaning that but he said that now I am a bureaucrat engaged in what Max Weber the famous sociologist termed the institutionalization of charisma so what Max the ex-Max is probably a worm in store right now but what Max Weber was describing was that great religious leaders come and they have tremendous charisma, he calls it charisma, we would call it spiritual power, to uh, transmit a religious experience to many people by which they become attracted and they change their lives and sinners become saints by the influence of these what Max calls charismatic leaders. So, so many people come together and they think this is very wonderful and we should spread it to others and follow the teachings of our religious leader. So to spread the teachings and to follow systematically the teachings of their leader, they need to get organized. When you organize, there has to be some kind of institution, especially after the passing of the charismatic leader, the, the same personal spiritual force is not there, but the, the instructions are there. So, to follow that you need an organization, and the organization has rules and regulations and properties, and all. it's an institution. Um, our Acharya Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, I'll read something from an article by him, in which as is typical for him, he makes some astounding claims <coughs> about how, the, how organized religion is the worst enemy of religion. You have to listen very carefully because it's Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati and his language is such that it's not so easy to follow. He's giving the example of Putana how Putana was the killer of children, so he compares the, the churches and um, the supposed spiritual leaders to be like Putana who, as soon as they see any tendency towards real spiritual life, they spoil it, they kill it. Putana is the slayer of all infants. The baby, when he comes out of the mother's womb, falls at once into the hands of the pseudo-teachers of religion. These teachers are successful in forestalling the attempts of the good preceptor, Sanguru, whose help is never sought by the atheists of this world at the baptisms of their babies. This is ensured by the arrangements of all established churches of the world. In other words, all organized religions make sure that their members will never hear from a genuine sadhu. It's one of their main purposes. The established churches of the world have been successful only in supplying watchful putanas for effecting the spiritual destruction of persons. From the moment of their birth, with the cooperation of their worldly parents, 
no human contrivance can prevent these Putanas from obtaining possession of the pulpits. This is due to the general prevalence of atheistic disposition in the people of this world. The church, this is a key sentence, the church that has the best chance of survival in this damned world is that of atheism under the convenient guise of theism. I'll, I'll say that again. The church that has the best chance of survival in this damned world is that of atheism under the convenient guise of theism. The churches have always proved the staunchest upholders of the grossest form of worldliness from which even the worst of non-ecclesiastical criminals are found to recoil. It's pretty heavy, isn't it? Well, if we think of the Inquisition, and the Crusades in Christian history, those from the West may know of this, we can understand. It is not from any deliberate opposition to the ordained clergy that these observations are made. The original purpose of the established churches of the world may not always be objectionable, but no stable religious arrangement for instructing the masses has yet been successful. The Supreme Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in pursuance of the teachings of the scriptures, enjoins all absence of conventionalism for the teachers of the eternal religion. It does not follow that the mechanical adoption of the unconventional light by any person will make him a fit teacher of religion. Regulation is necessary for controlling the inherent worldliness of conditioned souls. But no mechanical regulation has any value even for such a person. The bona fide teacher of religion is neither any product of nor the favorer of any mechanical system. In his hands, no system has likewise the chance of degenerating into a lifeless arrangement. The mere pursuit of fixed doctrines and fixed liturgies cannot hold a person to the true spirit of doctrine or liturgy. Now here's another key statement coming up. The idea of an organized church in an intelligible form indeed marks the close of the living spiritual movement. The great ecclesiastical establishments are the dikes and the dams to retain the current that cannot be held by any such contrivances. They indeed indicate a desire on the part of the masses to exploit a spiritual movement for their own purpose. They also unmistakably indicate the end of the absolute and unconventional guidance of the bona fide spiritual teacher. The people of this world understand preventive systems. They have no idea at all of the unprevented positive eternal life. Neither can there be any earthy contrivance for the permanent preservation of the life eternal on this mundane plane on the popular scale. <clears throat> Those are therefore greatly mistaken who are disposed to look forward to the amelioration of the worldly state in any worldly sense from the worldly success of any really spiritual movement. It is these worldly expectants who become the patrons of the mischievous race of the pseudo-teachers of religion, the Putinas, whose congenial function is to stifle the theistic disposition at the very moment of its suspected appearance. But the real theistic disposition can never be stifled by the efforts of those Putinas. The Putinas have power only over the atheist. It is a thankless but salutary task which they perform for the benefit of their unwilling victims.
But as soon as theistic disposition proper makes its appearance in the pure cognitive essence of the awakened soul, the Putanas are decisively silenced at the very earliest stage of their encounter with newborn Krishna. The would-be slayer is herself slain. This is the reward of the negative services that the Putanas unwittingly render to the cause of theism by strangling all hypocritical de demonstrations against their own hypocrisy. It's a little difficult to follow, you have to key into it. But Putana does not at all like to receive her reward in only form, in the only form which involves the total destruction of her wrong personality. King Kangsa also does not like to lose the services of the most trusted of his agents. The effective silencing of the whole race of pseudo-teachers of religion is the first clear indication of the appearance of the Absolute on the mundane plane. The bona fide teacher of the Absolute heralds the advent of Krishna by his uncompromising campaign against the pseudo-teachers of religion. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasrat Thakur is saying that organized religion is certain to stifle genuine theistic tendency. But that the genuine theistic tendency is always carried by, pronounced by, distributed genuine the good preceptors and sadhguru, genuine devotees and that the attempt of organized religion is to stifle real religion but it is not able to stifle the genuine guru who will uh, crush the Putanas and establish Krishna as he is. Now it's interesting to know that Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who stood against the the caste Goswamis who had institutionalized the cult of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to complete cheating cult, and others who in the name of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were cheating others. So he stood against that. In doing so, he also made an organization. It's interesting to note. It's also interesting to note that the difficulties that he had with his organization, both while he was present in this world and particularly after he left this world, of course he's always here in the form of his instruction, but uh, the organization he formed went through tremendous difficulties. And Prabhupada also, even before he had any following, any real following, he started an organization. He founded, first of all, the League of Devotees. He didn't have any followers, any real committed followers. And he founded ISKCON also. He, at that time, he also didn't really have any really committed followers. So, notwithstanding the inherent difficulties in organizations, our recent Acharyas, Bhakti Nautaka, also formed Vishva Vaishnav Sabha. Oh, and he had his Namhata preaching. Not so much organized, Navadi Town Pracharini Sabha, he made another organization also, Bhakti Namtaka. So they made organizations and having discussed this far, then the question comes up, well, can bad, can ISKCON also become a movement that works against the principles of religion 
Well, Prabhupada himself warned that this could happen. Prabhupada said that this movement cannot be stopped from outside. It can be stopped from inside. So Prabhupada warned that that was possible. He said it this. He also said that if you stop this preaching, then everything will become lifeless. Here in Mayapur, he saw that some devotees weren't attending class and he, he, was, he came very, uh, spoke very strongly and said that, well, if you're not hearing and chanting, then this building it will become, that no one will come. And then it will simply become a place for the pigeons to live and pass through. As we see in so many temples, they're full of stew, bat stew, bird stew. People don't go there. So it's a nice place for lower species of life. So, it's a dilemma. Organized religion is a has its inherent problems. On the other hand, if, we, if there's no organization, then how can we spread Krishna consciousness? How can we even practice some organization is needed? An institution is required to, for all this, I mean, if there was no institution, then this, this whole Mayapur project wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. And an institution is required to stabilize the prophet's message. They give a message, this should be done, that should be done. So then some rules and regulations are required for persons who come to Krishna consciousness. Rupa Goswami Prabhupada has given rules and regulations. Then how to follow these rules and regulations in a systematic manner for many people then the ashrams are required and rules are required for persons living in ashrams and even for those who want to be initiated or, or take up fresh conscious seriously not living in ashrams then rules are required for them also and rules how different people interact with each other those who are living in the ashram those who are not living in the ashram. So an institution is required, but obviously the institution is not a substitute. The institution is not a substitute for the, just like this Max Weber says, that it's, it's institution uh, the institutionalization of the of charis charismatic leadership. So, the having an institution with rules and regulations, it's not a substitute for the dynamic spiritual leadership that inspires such an organization in the beginning. But it's a, a means to. Uh, Keep the the, the, pur the purposes a means to its to affect that the teachings of the acharyas they can be perpetuated within human society. We can say that an institution it's like an interface between the material and the spiritual. An institution with it, it means buildings, organizations rules, regulations, these in themselves do not constitute Krishna consciousness. But they are to facilitate that. It is the, it is the external representation or, or the external manifestation or supposed to be the external manifestation of an, an internal spiritual experience. So, 
we can understand that sometimes it's said that the buildings or everything used in Krishna's service it's completely spiritual but it's spiritual only to the extent that it's actually used in Krishna's service it's not we could say that this watch is spiritual because I look at it to see what I have to now I have to go to Mongol Arti. I don't use it to see that I now I have to turn on the TV and watch the sports program. So it's being used for a spiritual purpose. So it can be called spiritual. But then it's not inherently spiritual in itself. If uh, I keep it in my pocket, if one of the thieves are here, be careful. They steal your watch out of your pocket or something. And they, then someone else takes it and they see now I have to catch my train to go to Calcutta so that I can go to my office. Then it won't be spiritual. It's only the purpose for which it's used, by which we can say this is a. Otherwise, this watch is just like any other Casio watch. Is that how it's pronounced? Casio, Casio, whatever. Uh, it's just like any other watch, but it can be called spiritual because it's used in Krishna's service. So, in the same way, the buildings, even the rules and regulations, everything in the Krishna conscious movement may be said to be spiritual in as much as it's used in Krishna's service. It all depends on the intent. What is the intent? Um, it's a it's an interface, like you say, between the material and the spiritual. And everything depends upon the intent, but we have to be very careful because institution means money, power, prestige, all these things can come, do come. And these things can be contaminated. Traditionally it's warned that sadhus, they should be free from Two main things, Prabhupada quotes it in the first canto of Bhagavatam. Kanak and Kamini. Gold or money and Kamini. Kamini means uh, women or the lustful desire to enjoy the opposite sex. So traditionally sadhus they avoid these two things. But in the modern age, um, you see the or one in, in our ISKCON, money is there, that's required for preaching Krishna. It's not required for chanting Hare Krishna. But it's required for printing books, developing temples, coming to Mayapur from wherever we happen to be and so many things and Kamini that Kamini that covers all other kinds of Kama or that means the desire for Lab, Puja, Pratishta well Lab comes under profit but to prestige, position, power so all these things are there in an institution also because there has to be leader, leaders and followers and leaders, especially in a religious institution, they are to be respected. In the Protestant churches, it's more democratic, it's more like Rithvikism or something like this in which everyone is all the same. You just read the book and you go to God, but still they have some kind of leadership. But the uh, position of guru that gives a tremendous position for exploitation. If one is not pure in the position of guru, if one is not thinking only how to serve Krishna and the parampara by accepting disciples, but if one is interested in anything else, then uh, it's possible to 
the, the greatest position of misleading. It's possible to be like that. So, it could be said that an institution is a, an, a necessary evil. It shouldn't be evil, but it's practically inevitable because we're in the material world and we're dealing with, we are, as Prabhupada wrote in one purport, that almost everyone I have to initiate is coming from the ranks of the conditioned soul. So we're all conditioned souls and we're trying to be Krishna conscious. But temptation can be very strong and Maya is very strong. And as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained to Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, it may be even that Maya is so subtle that we may be doing something and in our mind we're thinking I'm doing it for Krishna but there's some mixture of personal motive also so it would seem almost inevitable that the adverse effects of institution of, of having an institution is going to be there in any religious institution even that which professes the highest ideals because as we are all probably aware it's much easier to talk of high ideals than to actually live by them 100% mm. so yeah, an institution is founded to give material facilities for spiritual activities, like these buildings. They're made so that people can come to the town and chant Hare Krishna. However, it may be that certain persons are attracted by they think that well it's a good material facility so let me take advantage of it now to to have this facility i what's my requirement i have to go to the temple do some service okay because i'm living at I'm living in my village and there's there's no job, there's no income, but I've heard people say this, I'll, I'll try and get a job and if I don't get one, I'll join a temple. Because, you know, it solves, at least it solves the chapati problem. And then while I'm in the temple, I'll see if there's any chance, I'll get it. In the meantime, I'll, I'll look around and if there's any job, I'll get one. So that's not very worthy. Um, some people may come like that directly with material intention. And it's a, an ongoing syndrome we see in India that uh, it appears that many people who join, they make a calculation that maybe I have to invest eight years of my life in being a devotee in the temple but then I, I think within about seven or eight years if I, if I do everything nicely and please everyone then I can get a trip to America and when I go there I, can st I have to stay in the temple for another two or three years then I get my green card and the day they get their green card they're out it's all calculated that I have I'll invest 10 years and within that 10 years I'll live nicely and anyway, I'll get my food and shelter. Then I'll be in America and uh, once I get my green card I can go and sell t-shirts or whatever else. And so they may also be devotees of some sort. Most of those who do that, they remain in contact with the temple and they may 
after getting their green card in America, they may give donations to temple and this and that. They're, they're also devotees, but they're really, they've got the material interest more prominent than the spiritual interest. So to, it may be almost impossible to keep material interest out, but we have to see that the spiritual side is kept stronger than the material side. We can't, if, if, if we say we'll keep out all material interest, then we don't need an institution anyway. Because if we're all totally pure devotees, then we don't need an institution. Because just like in Satya Yuga, there are no religious institutions because more or less everyone is Paramahamsa. So what do they need an institution? So we can recognize that there are material needs and material desires but the, the real trick is to keep it more spiritually focused than materially focused that, that the, the facilities are provided for spiritual life and the persons who come they come because really they're interested in spiritual life and the material facilities are there because we require something not that I'm coming because I require some material facility and therefore I'll do some chanting Hare Krishna. Now, another, uh, another way in which people can be more materially influenced, and, and it, that's actually um, can be more da damaging than those who are directly with the aim of utilizing the institution for their own material needs. In other words, those, those uh, young men without any hope in life by their material qualifications who join in India and get out to America, they may not actually harm the movement so much, but more dangerous is People who join with a spiritual aim, but without, in many cases, or in most cases, without even recognizing it themselves, their spiritual aim becomes compromised by material considerations. Um, just to give an example. One thing here, I'm not, um, I'm not specifically pointing fingers at anyone, nor am I saying that this is, that everyone is affected by this, but I think we can all recognize, or maybe we can, as we discuss some of these things, that these traits that I'm talking about are endemic. In other words, it's not just something I'm making up. So, what often happens, just to, yeah, to give an example, that someone may join, live in the temple, be very enthusiastic, I want to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, but after some time, he or she, as we say nowadays, um, they start to think that, well, I'm not going to make it all my life without getting married, so I require to get married. So, alright, no problem in that. The Hasta Ashram is allowed, fine. Um, but then it may be that the, that the devotee is doing some important service, maybe a service that others are not so expert in. So they don't get kicked out of the temple when they get married, but um, they don't have to leave. They are supported by the temple. You take some allowance and you go on with your service. So, okay, all well and good. But it is the but, but, but. 
It is the nature of the Grihastha Ashram that they have many material needs, more so than the Brahmacharya, who is supposed to live very simply. He doesn't have many material needs. Financially, a Brahmachari is a great asset for a temple. If he goes out and distributes books, brings in lots of money, and uh, all he needs is a little space to sleep on, he lives very simply. But Krihasa life is more complex, and especially when there are children, then the needs increase very much, especially in countries like India, where mostly people, they don't want to send their children to the uh, government schools, they want them to send to private schools, which are very expensive. And so, Grihastas, their needs become their, their economic need, or what they feel they need, becomes more than what is deemed to be their worth from the temple's point of view. They become a, a liability instead of an asset. And so they can only go on being supported by the institution if they bring in lots of money or if they have some position within the institution. So it may be in many cases that Grihastas who are supported by the institution, they are doing their service, but they are thinking always, what am I getting? And we've heard many times that there's a saying that Grihastha devotee is saying that, well, you should pay me this much because if I was doing this, if I was doing this outside, I'd be getting so much, so you should give me that much. And it's become normal in many areas of our movement throughout the world that devotees expect payment for the services that they're doing. And then it's not really bhakti anymore. They are thinking, how much do I get from it? And even they advertise that in that job available, temple president, and what other they get facilities, so many thousands of dollars a month, and car, and this and that, and of course free prasad and everything we get. So, um, and people, and, and they advertise jobs available. So it becomes a means of livelihood rather than it's seen as a means of livelihood rather than as a means of service to Krishna, a means of spiritual advancement. And for the, for the householder, that's their, that's their immediate need. When the baby's crying, then uh, you, you know, they may think, well, you know, I want to go back to Godhead, but the first thing I've got to feed the baby. So there are some immediate needs and they can be fulfilled by serving the institution. And, and one does service for the institution, and the, the institution maintains the person for doing so. But what is happening is that because it's being done for a worldly need, therefore the, the spiritual focus cannot be maintained the same and it, in many cases it doesn't even matter, it doesn't seem to matter because the, the person is paid to, for instance, do the accounts. So that's what he's paid for. He's not paid for going to Mangalati. So whether he goes to Mangalati or not becomes an option for him. And he's one of the leading devotees and he has a major say 
in what is going what in the affairs of the temple but he may not it's not required for him to have any real spiritual life at all it's required for him to do his job properly to be expert in management and in organizing a temple that the temple president he may see that that my real need is to see there's enough income that's the, that's the first need. So, that's the basis on which the temple is organized. How is there enough income? I mean, of course, for, for Krishna consciousness. But, often the, for Krishna consciousness, what is see, seen as being for Krishna consciousness, it is at odds. We need the money for preaching Krishna consciousness. But if we preach Krishna consciousness, then people won't give us money. Sometimes we think like that. Just like, for instance, there was one uh, video show of, of Tamal Krishna Goswami, very famous, Gods, Demigods and Incarnations, in which he openly, very philosophically, shows, among other things, that Sai Baba is Sai Baba, which means he's a nonsense. But uh, it's nonsense and a rascal also. That we know. So this, which was this video, which was very effective in, in very clearly presented what is the situation, how Krishna is supreme. In many centers of ISKCON in India, they told, don't distribute that. Many people be can become devotees, but the donor, many people are donating. They, they follow this, you know, this rascal and that rascal and another rascal, and they won't like to donate. So, we need the donations to come so that we can make people devotees and preach Krishna consciousness. But don't preach Krishna consciousness as it is, because then people won't give donations. So, the just see what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati taught. This is only one example. That the, the organized religion acts against the purpose for which it was set up. That keeping the institution running becomes more important than the professed purpose of the institution. Because if we don't have enough money coming in, then who's going to pay my salary? And if people will complain. Then I have to deal with them. And we have everyone in the temple there being paid to do their service. So we don't want any people to join the temple. They're just a disturbance. Because then, you know, they're, they're not getting paid. And they'll wonder why everyone else is getting paid. And then we have to look after them and train them. So in many temples, they don't want to make new devotees because they think it's just a, just a disturbance. Everything is going on. We're preaching. In, in Iskon in India, preacher means someone who goes out and brings donations. That is the definition of a preacher in many centers. So, um, well, in some centers in India, they, they, the people come and join as Brahmacharis, that's good, because then we have someone free to clean the floor. You don't have to pay anyone to clean the floor. But uh, in some place in America, they, they, they open and say, we don't want people to join. What do we want people to join for? So they're satisfied that people will, people will come, and then you show them this is a nice temple, and oh, but actually the people may say, well, we like to worship Lord Shiva. Okay, no problem, we'll install Lord Shiva also. That's also gone on. Demigod worship is, has been introduced into several temples in America because it's thought that, well, the, the, the Hindu people are coming and we should please them and then they'll give donations and then life can go on. But for what purpose the temple is actually meant for and for what purpose Prabhupada came to the West to preach Krishna consciousness, that is no longer thought of. And it will be said that, well, you know, times have changed and it will be rationalized and 
this and that, but the actual purpose of the institution isn't being fulfilled. So um, it can be that originally uh, the, temples are found, the temples are founded and the institution started on the principle of preaching, which is uh, preaching Christian consciousness, making people devotees, is very elevated purpose. But that degrades into a uh, neophyte kind of mentality in which devotional service is redefined in which it's in which it said, well, it's not really necessary to follow all the things that Prabhupada said. Be realistic. Don't be a fanatic. Nowadays, a, a temple president told me this. He said to me that nowadays in Iskon, if you just want to follow the basic things that Prabhupada said, then you're called a fanatic and you're not welcome. Consider there's something wrong with you. And you shouldn't preach to follow all these things. So, there are some problems there. It, it may be that, uh, like that, we fear that if we actually preach the highest stuff, because if we're not following ourselves, then we don't want someone may have an institutional position because he's good at managing or somehow he's got that position but somehow has become compromised and doesn't follow all the principles very strictly and uh, they, they, they may become disturbed by persons preaching as Prabhupada preached or as we're supposed to preach because then it exposes them but why are you saying we should all rise early in the morning, this is fanatical, and why are you saying we should follow all these principles? So, actually, if, if one wants to live by those principles, then one may be opposed for doing so within the very institution that's supposed to be the epitome of those principles, supposed to be preaching those principles. But even within the institution itself, they are not followed, and it's it may be difficult to follow them in some cases, not in every case. As another temple president told me once, that um, a man approached him and said that, should we follow what is described in your books, or should we follow what you actually do? <laughs> there was a clear difference. There shouldn't be. Prabhupada said, books are the basis of this movement. That means in every way, we're supposed to follow what's in the books. If an, if an outsider can see that there is a clear difference between what's in the books and what we do, then there's something wrong there. And in many cases, I know that someone they, they want to join the temple because they're inspired by reading Prabhupada's books but then within a short time they find that the ideals that are in Prabhupada's books are not being lived up to within the temple and they become discouraged naturally and therefore some, are, some people recommend don't join the temple it's better for your Krishna consciousness to stay outside that's a very, if that's true that's a very sad thing because the temple is supposed to be the ideal by which others who are living outside and not having the opportunity to engage fully in Krishna consciousness, the idea by which they can become inspired. But in some, pla in some place we see that the congregational members themselves are in many ways more serious than the devotees living in the temple. Because the congregational devotees, they, they have their maya, they have, their, they have to maintain their family, but they're serious that whatever that, that, that we want to be Krishna conscious, whereas those in the temple may be thinking that it's uh, Kawa Dawa Dukan, as Prabhupada used to quote his own spiritual master. It's a, it's a place for eating and sleeping. 
Prabhupada warned against this. He said our temples, they're not meant to be free hotels. So, um, in, by institutionalization, one may fear losing his institutional position which secures his material needs. Um, now, in a, in a religious institution, a person is, or a leader, is to be followed. It's a natural thing. Prabhupada wanted that, that authorities should be followed. But then authorities, they also have to follow the basic principles. But if one, without following the principles, says, look, I'm a leader, you have to follow me then uh, it's, it's like using the institutional position to maintain your position but for the leaders themselves should be ideal as Prabhupada said so many times if, if leaders are not ideal but use their position to insist that you should I'm right because I'm in a position that should never be said even a guru shouldn't say that even Krishna never said that when Arjuna asked Arjuna had so many doubts that he expressed to Krishna. That, hey, what are you talking about? You said you instructed Vivaswan, but you're just the same age as me. How is it possible? Katame Tadvijaniya Tamado Proktavaniti. Of course, Arjuna didn't exactly reject Krishna, but he asked, How is it possible? And then Krishna explained. And Krishna didn't say, Look, shut up. I'm God and I told you. He didn't say that. He explained to him, Both you and I have had many births. Explain to him on the basis of Shastra. I, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, about following Prabhupada, what it means to follow Prabhupada. But it's interesting to know that Rupa Goswami, among the qualities of Krishna, he describes him as Shastra Chakshushpa. One, he has the quality of seeing through Shastra. Even though he himself gives Shastra, but he doesn't transgress them. So, it may be that we tend to think of, of, of position and spiritual advancement. We, try to, we tend to forge the thing, two things together. Because some, we think that, well, because someone has an institutional position, sannyasi, guru, whatever, that they must be spiritually advanced because the institution has awarded a position to them. Actually, there's no need for sannyas. Sannyas is for fools. Because everyone is foolish, then someone has to take sannyas because they have something to say and people will think, oh, he's a sannyasi, I should listen. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas for the same reason. Because people weren't listening to him. They thought, ah, he's just a he's just a young boy, householder like me. So who's who is this Nimal? So then he took sannyas for fools. And then they said, Oh, sannyas, okay. <laughs> so sannyas he shouldn't be a fool, but because people tend to respect oh sannyas, okay. And actually in ISKCON we are very strict about giving sannyas now, which is good. But uh, we should understand that sannyas, the need to award sannyas is because if that person is actually spiritually capable and of giving instruction, then it would be hoped that people could recognize that because they don't, therefore, okay, this is sannyas, you should listen to him. Otherwise, we should just see this person is spiritually advanced, we should listen. But because we don't recognize, therefore we give sanity. Now you listen. So because we don't have the power to see, therefore the institution says, this person is authorized. But we should see, because it may be that sannyas or Sankitan party leader or temple president or whatever, it may be that, uh, or even Guru, because actually in Guru and Iskon in many ways, 
it's an institutional position. That's another topic, which uh, maybe that's too big to get into here. But gurus in ISKCON, they don't really act, in some ways they don't really act as traditionally gurus do. Because as Bhaktisthan Sosa Thakur was pointing out, they have, there are institutional checks on them which, which should not be needed for guru. <laughs> If a person is a guru, then he also shouldn't need an institution to say he's a guru. But it's, there's an institutional need for gurus. So, whatever, that position is, a, a hierarchical position is awarded, and generally people think that this person has a position, so they must be, we should listen to what they say. And generally, that should be so. But it may not be. The person generally it's hoped that those who are given a position they are fit to discharge it. But some mistakes may be made in awarding position. Or it may be that a person is capable, but then later they become compromised. So we shouldn't accept someone simply the tendency is there which is a good tendency to accept it's good to some degree to accept what someone says because we respect their spiritual position but at the same time we are enjoined to understand not be blind followers but to understand through Guru, Sadhu and Shastra what is going on blind following is for blind people for foolish people and there may be many people who are attracted to that that the weak minded people who they just want someone to tell you do this, you do that, ok then I don't have to think but Prabhupada wanted to create Brahmanas, people who are independently thoughtful. That doesn't, that doesn't mean, independently thoughtful means that they intelligently apply the teachings of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra, having learned them. That doesn't, by independent, that doesn't mean like a bowel or something. You just, you see the bowels in Bengal, they just wander from place to place and they're, they're, they're they have no... Uh, that's Taoism is totally disorganized religion. They don't, they don't have any authority to answer to. Independently thoughtful doesn't mean that we don't follow any authority. The general tendency should be to respect the authority, but one should be... Um, one should see where that authority comes from. The, 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 ultimately the authority is from Shastra so we should see that one is a, a person is exercising authority on the basis of Shastra and on the basis of genuine spiritual concern that if authorities do that they'll, they'll naturally command respect but if one demands if one, if one is only demanding respect, then it won't happen. It means dysfunction. As Prabhupada often said, Krishna conscious, this movement, it operates on love and trust. Not such easy, not so easy. If it was only love and trust, again, we wouldn't need an institution. Or we wouldn't need rules and regulations of the institution. That there are rules and regulations recognizes the fact that we are conditioned souls. But the Prophet said this institution should run on love and trust means that we should come to the highest standard. The spiritual necessity or the spiritual purpose must be kept prominent. 
What are we here for? To cultivate Krishna consciousness, not to cultivate our bellies. We're here to cultivate love of Krishna, love of the Vaishnavas. This is the purpose. Now, as I was saying, Maya may be very subtle. That we, we may be thinking, yes, well, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm instructing this person in this way so that they can serve the institution better. And we, but then we have to see if the institution is actually on track. Is it actually functioning for the sake of living Krishna consciousness and preaching Krishna consciousness? If, if we say that, well, we're, we're here to serve ISKCON, but then we should see that ISKCON is firmly on the path given by Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas. We can expect that in this damned world, as we just quoted Bhaktisthan Sanskrit Thakur, that the tendency will be for it to veer off course. So we shouldn't assume, or we shouldn't be, as Prabhupada said, don't expect utopia. We shouldn't just presume that just by walking in the door of ISKCON and saying, I am an ISKCON member, that everything will be perfect, that everything in ISKCON will be perfect. We can rather assume that there will be imperfection because we are all coming from the platform of imperfection. But we should be intelligent enough and learned enough to distinguish between that which is genuinely Krishna conscious and that which isn't and not be misled into thinking that something which is not Krishna conscious is Krishna conscious. And we should not be misled into thinking that something which is Krishna conscious is not Krishna conscious. Just like it's sometimes said, well if you preach so strongly or if you preach so clearly that people will be turned away and so it's not good. But actually unless you speak clearly then no one will ever get a clear idea. They'll remain in the fog of mind. So without, so we may say that sometimes it's said like this, well, Prabhupada spoke strongly but we shouldn't. Although actually Prabhupada said we should. Because if we don't speak clearly then we're, not, then we're speaking unclearly. If we're not, speaking clearly means to speak Krishna consciousness. Speaking unclearly means there's an admixture of mind. So by speaking, by not speaking the truth, then people can never understand what is the truth. But sometimes it's said, well, people will become upset, as if that's the worst thing in the world. If people become, we should just think, we should make people favorable. This is one of the aims of the modern Christian world. If people like us, that's good. And that's true. If the public likes us, that's good. But they should like us for what we stand for, not for what they stand for. If they like us because we approve of we are part of them, then what's the use? Then we lost our soul. That's Faustian philosophy. Dr. Faust, he, he sold his soul to the devil, to Satan. So we, we, have, we have to keep the purpose of our institution very clearly focused that the institution as a whole and every member within it is meant for pleasing Krishna and the previous Acharyas in the manner that they prescribe, not in the manner that we imagine. So, um, let's go on. Yeah, um, the, the purpose, we have to keep that very clear. If the purpose for which this movement is founded becomes subordinated to just keeping the institution running on. What's going on? If, 
if we think the most important thing is we have to keep the institution running on and but what's the purpose we don't consider well that's not so we have to keep the institution running on we can't get anyone to do the service so we have to pay everyone we can't get anyone to do the service that means we're already a failure we couldn't inspire anyone to serve Krishna for the sake of serving Krishna therefore we'll pay people but then it's not Krishna conscious it's, it's a means of it becomes like any other temple in India or anywhere else where the temple is it's a material it serves a material function not a spiritual function the material function is that the the pujaris they are maintained by the offerings of the people who come and they give material benedictions the people come for material benedictions and the pujaris are they give some money in the hope that they'll get blessed by the god for their for their material uplift and the pujaris don't they, they don't want to preach anything spiritual to them because then they might start stop coming and giving donations so it becomes not that the pujaris themselves have any idea of spiritual love it's totally materialistic so our temples can become like that also and in some cases we can say they have but the temple is run on for the sake of running it on and there's no dynamic there's no zeal to become surrendered to Krishna or please Krishna sometimes there may be some show of book distribution made so we can say yes we're doing book distribution but the real purpose is, has become lost so this may happen or can happen or does happen or will happen unless what is the solution well, the solution is to keep the purpose in mind that we're here only to serve Krishna. The solution is to keep a very strong spiritual focus that we're here to serve Krishna. The institution, it, we can't say that the institution in and of itself is bad because if the purpose is maintained very strongly that we're here to serve Krishna and maintaining our families maintaining our hierarchical position this is only secondary then everything will be very nice mm. theoretically anyone in any position should be willing to step down if he considers that someone else could do the service better than me. Someone else can preach Krishna consciousness better than me. It's often very difficult though because when a, when a person has been in the institution for 10 years, 15 years and they don't know anything else, they don't have any job or career and they have their family and they'll be very reluctant to re relinquish that position to some often people in that situation they may not be very dynamic they may be compromised and it could be said that well someone who's actually got the spirit of preaching they could fulfill the function of a spiritual leader better but the person who's in the position they won't want to relinquish them because otherwise how will I go on I, how can I maintain my family? And we may think, well, it's not fair to them also. They've done so many years of service. And now, how can you just tell them to do something else? So that becomes a dilemma also. But actually what happens is the whole spiritual ideal and the spiritual function becomes clogged up by certain individuals material needs how to solve this it's, it's not so easy and those who are in position they 
they, the institution needs running on. We need pujaris, we need cooks, we need all this. So individuals may be seen in terms of the function they can perform to keep the institution running on. Whereas actually the institution is meant to run on to facilitate the, each individual member's development of Krishna consciousness. So the institution is meant to function for the need of the individuals. But it, it may become turned around that the individual we, we see as someone who can serve the needs of the institution. So what to do? Um, well, that's, it's easier as usual, it's easier to describe the problems than to solve them. Um, One thing we should see is that, well, I, you may say I've painted a very black picture today. But this is, after all, only one side of the picture. Mostly we, as I said, we don't usually like to discuss these things. Especially when we come to Mayapur, there's lots of chanting and dancing. And this is what we've come for. It's inspiring, it's enlivening. But as I said at the beginning, it, it, it's often people find that, you know, we're here for spiritual life, but on the other, on the other hand, devotees they often go away being discouraged at seeing that what is being advertised and what's actually going on. There's there's often a dichotomy. So, uh, what I want to say here is that there probably always will be some kind of a dichotomy because the ideal and the practical. It's rare to find in this world that the two things go on side by side. So we ourselves should be focused and we should recon recognize that what is Krishna conscious and what isn't. And so this institution is meant to facilitate Krishna conscious and in many ways it does. There is book distribution going on, there is prasadam distribution going on, there are temples being built, there is the spirit of Krishna Goddess. There are genuine devotees in this school. Of course, some people may say there are. That you have to decide for yourself. So, Iskon is meant for facilitating sadhu sangha, genuine sadhu sangha. So, we should uh, see if that is available, where is it, where it is available, and take advantage of that. And as much as possible within our capacity, we may try to uh, address the problems of UNESCO, these kind of institutional difficulties. But actually, often it's very difficult to do so. I have experience. It is very difficult to even discuss, even very glaring discrepancies because often if, if someone points out there's a problem then usually the finger is pointed at them that the problem is with you how can you dare to suggest that there could be something wrong which is a very foolish as an institutional policy it's very foolish to reject people pointing out there are things that are wrong how, how can you suggest there's something wrong as if everything automatically must be right that there are no problems but somehow we have the ethic or the lack of ethics within a lack of ethics within our movement that if anyone points out that there's something wrong that they something is wrong with them you are wrong you're your fault finder you're a Vaishnava Paradi so even pointing out legitimate problems. Of course there are there are supposed to be mechanisms within our movement by which problems are pointed out but factually speaking these mechanisms they largely don't work to be frank. That anyone who points out there's something wrong just they create more problems for themselves and therefore people think all right let's not point out anything wrong and you do whatever you want. People go away. This happens many times. They leave our movement. 
or they think let me do bhajan at home by myself or let me join another movement ISKCON is not the only Gorya Vaishnava society but then uh, what we find is that in other institutions they also have the same kind of problems going away it doesn't necessarily solve the problem one devotee I know he was I know him for many years since the 19 mid 1980s so he was a member of ISKCON and for certain reasons I can't really blame him he left his con and he became a sannyasi in one Gorya month. So I met him a few years ago. And we'd always had a very nice relationship which didn't change by him going away. And so we we took lunch together and he came to an Iskon center. And then we discussed somewhat about various things. And he said that he told me that all the problems you have in Iskon we also have in our month. And he listed some of them, corruption, homosexuality, this and that. And he said, but you don't hear about it in our mind because we are small. <laughs> and ISKCON is big. So we have all the same problems, just on a smaller scale. So going away and joining another institution, it may not solve the problem. We, we may think that, well, we may, we may think that, well, I'm getting better sadhu sangha, that might be might be a good reason to leave, but the problems are going to be there in any institution. So, we could say, well, I'll start my own society, you know, I'm pure, so I'll start my own society, but it's the same thing. We may be pure. Prabhupada was pure. Srila Bhaktisthan Sasari Thakur was pure, but not everyone who came to him was pure, so. You may be better off just letting someone else manage the problems and find the bottom line I'm saying here is find good association. In any institution you'll find there are some people who are compromised, some people who are misusing the institution and some people who are genuinely trying to live for the purpose of the institution. Um, as you can surmise from this speech that I've given, I also don't think it's a good idea just to turn a blind, just to pretend that problems don't exist. They do exist, they will exist. But at the same time, we have to be spiritually intelligent enough to find out that association which will help us to advance in Krishna consciousness. And spiritually intelligent enough also to realize that there will be problems and we shouldn't just reject the institution or everyone within it because then everyone is not a Paramahamsa. We shouldn't demand that ideal either. We should follow in the footsteps of the Paramahamsas, seek out that goal, but at the same time not be so uh, impossibly idealistic as to reject everyone who is not living up to the standard of Paramahamsa. And at the same time, there's always two sides, at the same time, not uh, accept persons who are in the name of Prabhupada and Iskon actually living a compromised life. So, I'll speak more about this. The, the com what is really dangerous is even more than taking advantage of material facilities or, or sp facilities that are developed for spiritual purposes. More dangerous than that, uh, taking advantage of the facilities for our own material needs is philosophical deviation. Usually the two things come side by side. But starting from tomorrow, I want to discuss what is really dangerous is philosophical deviation. But uh, today I just pointed out the dangers of institutionalization. Institutions are required, they can serve a good purpose, but at the same time they are 
that they, there is a tremendous opportunity for misuse of institutions, for the uh, compromised purposes of persons who are supposed to be leading them. So we should be aware of this. It can happen within the scrum, it is happening within the scrum, and it will continue. I don't think there's anything possible to stop it wholly, but it's not everyone in the scrum, it's not everyone in the scrum. So, like I say, we should find those who are actually very sincere, seek their association, and go on with our Krishna consciousness. And not, uh, it would also be foolish to reject the whole institution because of the faults of some of its members. If the whole institution becomes wholly corrupt, then we should reject it. I personally don't, I mean, I'm still in this room, so I don't feel that it is so. And we can find at this festival that devotees are coming for spiritual purpose, isn't it? Devotees are not coming here for any material purpose, so we can say that the spiritual focus of this of ISKCON is still strong. The, that some people may be subjugating the spiritual purpose for their own material needs, or they may be compromised, hasn't to date totally subjugated. ISKCON is not a totally materialistic movement. I don't feel so. But at the same time, there are, there may be another side which we should be aware of. So, this is the purpose of this lecture. Hare Krishna. So, any questions or comments? Yeah. Do we have a roaming mic by any chance? Goranga? That mic can be used for that purpose? Actually, if you write it down, that might be easier. If you write down the questions. In the meantime, if anyone has a question, they can say and I'll repeat it. Please say. Yes, I always have some conflicts. You always have some conflicts. Yeah. Because I distribute books. Because you distribute books. And with, uh, with that sort of income, I live. Ah. So you have a personal conflict yes. that you distribute books and it's your source of income. So, because if, I think if I don't do this, then I cannot maintain myself. Because you think if I don't do this, I can't maintain myself. Well, Prabhupada said that book distribution is an ideal means of family maintenance for a Grihasta. Book distribution is so good that even if it's done for the wrong purpose, <laughs> it's still highly beneficial. <laughs> but that's also not necessarily bad if you're maintaining your family in Krishna consciousness. Rather, you could think that I'm so lucky to have the opportunity to maintain my family by such an, ide such an ideal means. You're able to simultaneously give the highest benediction to the people you come in contact with. But at the same time, I think you can yourselves uh, confirm that if you're doing it thinking just how I can get money, then you can't sell any books. Isn't it? No one will buy any books. If you're thinking, I need to get the money, you can't get, it won't work. Book distribution only works when we're thinking how I can benefit others. Ananyas chinta yantra maam yejana pari parasiti Tesham nitya abhiyuktanam yoga kshemam vahamiyam If we think, let me do something to help others by giving them the books, and Krishna looks after us. Then, anything else? Do we have any written questions? Yeah, please pass up. 
No, okay. Now, from now on, we'll take written questions. Today, outside of India, we have paid pujaris. Outside of India, in India also. <laughs> Mostly. Can you see a way of reverting the situation? Is it possible? Very difficult. Once we make compromises to go to establish the proper standards, very difficult. Prabhupada was very much against actually paying pujaris. And actually, Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati also, he gave some quote that it's, it's actually highly sinful. How to, uh, how to, because Pujari, if he's householder, then he'll be steady. But then, and traditionally house, Pujaris are householders and they are supported by the income. But then the tendency to compromise, to see the deity as a, my means of income. So Prabhupada said that devotees, householders, they can have a stipend. A stipend is different to a salary. A stipend means just the minimum, minimal requirement for maintenance. But in the, in the modern age, the minimum, there's, there's no end. There's, it's going increasing and increasing. That's why you'll see the a job pujari required and the salary is given. You can speak in the mic or you can give a piece of paper. How to revert the situation is very difficult. Once the compromise is brought in, and people think, it's my right. And, and it's easy to manage in the sense that you pay everyone, it's easy, and then they don't complain. And they don't have any standards. I have a suggestion for this program. That, uh, because uh, why only uh, one, one Brahman worship the deity? The whole Brahman, they get involved in the deity worship. That all the members, in some temples they do like that, all the members of the community, they come for one day. That's one possible solution. What is the difference between an acharya and a guru? It's a little bit off the topic, so I won't answer this. I have some CDs for sale here. One of them I discussed this topic in some great detail. What is the difference in non gurus I read that Srila Prabhupada warned that the spirit of spontaneity should never be checked Please comment on this statement in light of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's remarks. Well, if there's no specific question, I mean the whole, the whole point is that the spirit of, yes, spontaneity, that we're here to serve Krishna. We want to serve Krishna. We're serving because we want to serve Krishna, not for the salary, not for the for the benefit we get. The purpose is to serve, we're here to serve Krishna. The building is there so that we can rest the body, bathe the body, perform the bodily functions so that we can serve Krishna. Not that we are here to serve, we're serving Krishna because by doing so we get food, clothing and shelter. So unless there's a specific question then uh, I don't really know what to say because it's the whole class is going on like that. Could you please write down Ganga Prabhu? Here's some paper and someone can give a pen. Hmm? Oh, well, if you have a loud enough voice, okay, say it. Thank you so much for the wonderful explanation about the about the movement and things. My personal feeling was Let's that keep it pure. It should be our commitment, yeah. every one of us, to keep this movement pure for Prabhupada. Right. It should be every one of our commitments. I was thinking about the solution. Mm. It's like if it's gone as an organization, make it very clear that if you want to join this organization and you are Vyasa, you have to thank for yourself and your family. Therefore, you can get a source of inspiration from the organization, but don't expect 
element of the form, material, yeah. as to speak. So it comes to a chinka veda veda tattva again. Yeah. My personal realization is that I want to be part of this organization, but I personally maintain myself by other means. Yeah. So I want to depend materially on the organization, but I depend on it spiritually for inspiration. So if this is made very clear, and everybody's understood that, then there's no problem. There shouldn't be a problem. No. Another thing, of course, that I always come back to this is that Prabhupada wanted that we have our own land-based communities. So that this gone, it's, it's not meant just to be an institution that collects money and spends it, but it's meant to, that's another whole big discussion, how uh, it's meant for or, well, it's meant for serving Krishna, but Prabhupada's social plan was that we don't have money. We live on the land. Where there's money, there's problems. So don't have money. Just produce what we need and chant Hare Krishna. Many of the... I see that many of the problems in our movement come because we've failed to implement this major instruction of Prabhupada for instituting Varnashram Dharma and uh, living on the living on the land and off the land. So many social problems come. And ISKCON becomes a means of social of, of economic sustenance. Well in one way Prabhupada wanted that, but on the farm community. Not that we collect money from the public and use it for our own Sustenance. I have a comment on this. Actually, I, I think it will, it will point out that a lot of you, the things you have explained in your classes, not just for thought care, but it's actually things that are happening. And this is what happened to me in uh, 1995. I'm not going to give any special names or examples or anything. But um, in America, at, at one point, there was a lot of uh, living up worship going on, even at one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually I made a complaint to the TPC and they passed a resolution, but what happened was, for example, they had like Rama Krishna mission coming to the temple, and, uh, and this Mayavadi Sanyasi, he is, I mean, they're renting the rent, and so they're basically just preaching in India about, I guess, Krishna consciousness. No need to worship these deities and the stones and all this kind of offensive stuff. People are going to the temple, and there's no signs or that, that this is not an ISKCON program. So they think that some ISKCON swami or something walks straight in there and listen to all this nonsense. So I, I, I blindly had a, a board meeting with uh, six leading uh, members, uh, including some DGCs, sannyasis, and I even tried to solicit the help of some other sannyasis and DGCs somewhere else in America and to no avail. And everybody just stuck on me because it's a was a, such a big money maker. And then finally, when when I uh, complained to the DDC that in 1996 uh, they passed a the resolution, and these things are definitely not in the line of good. Cloud you did something good. Prabhupada said, while to cooperate with each other, but some devotees still get separated from ISKCON and following the same rules. What are the results of this? As our very aim is to go back to Godhead. Do they achieve the goal? They may do. Someone may not be living in ISKCON or associating with the devotees and following all the principles. It's not anywhere stated in Shastra that you have to be a member of ISKCON to go. Or the, the qualification for going back to Godhead is that you have to be a member of ISKCON. The qualification is to be a devotee of Krishna. ISKCON is meant to facilitate that. And, of course, Prabhupada did also write that it's not possible to be Krishna conscious without being... What did he say exactly? 
in association with this society for Krishna conscious and anyone who thinks he can be is in an hallucination because we need association so but philosophically we can't it would be it would be bogus to say that you have to be a member of ISKCON to go back to Godhead that's that's not true it would be hoped that we can maintain a, a, a strong spiritual atmosphere by which people like to associate with us. It's sad if they go away. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was the perfect example of a sannyasi who would not go near women. When he instructed Rupa Goswami, he indicated that sannyasi should eat simply. That was Raghunath Das Goswami actually. Remain poverty stricken and always remember the Trinada P verse. So today we see apparent contradictions to the example of how sannyasis should act. Could you please talk a little on this topic? Actually, Raghunath Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Vairagi bhai, Grama Kotana Shunitaikani. He said, Vairagi, which is a little different from sannyas of the present age. Bhakti Saraswati Thakur, he addressed this whole thing. He said, that, uh, one can be a perfect sannyasi riding in a car which in those days cars was a very it was a sign of great prestige he, he said it all depends on the attitude of the person yukta vairagya if one's actual motive is to preach Krishna consciousness then one should not, not only could but should use it if one fails to use all the good things in this world for Krishna, that means he's misunderstood. One renounces all good things in the world because he thinks, because he has a spirit, I want to enjoy, therefore I shall renounce. But if one sees that everything is meant for Krishna, then we should use all the good things for Krishna's service. Failure to do so means a misunderstanding. All the best things of this world should be used for Krishna's service. So if one actually has an intention to preach, then he should use all the best facilities. That is real sannyas. Sometimes people think, oh, sannyasis, they're just enjoying themselves, flying here and there. You have, to, you have to see what are they doing when they're going here and there. They're going here and there, what are they doing? Are they preaching? If they're, if they're actually giving their energy for preaching Krishna consciousness, then they should fly here and there. But if they're not, then there's a problem. That's a, and again, that's a big topic. If some devotees are not qualified in their positions and do not want to step down, the GBC being highest authority, can they not correct the problem? No. Very difficult. Generally not. I mean, as long as, as, long as someone is following the basic principles, then it's... Uh, it's difficult when I mean, people, you know, then what do you have? They just have to wait and hope for the next generation or something. I don't know. We should be preaching straightforward facts. I something I agree to this. But we see that people are not able to digest it most of the time, as it is. Well, my personal experience is that I speak most of the time pretty straightforwardly and most of the time the only people who are not able to digest it are the members of our society who think that the public can't digest it. Mostly the problem comes from our own devotees who say you shouldn't speak strongly. I don't have so much problem from the members of the public. Now you could say I'm speaking in India where people are they have a culture of respecting sadhu, so that may be a factor. But in the West I speak the same also. And in India some people protest, and in the West some people protest. And uh, more or less if, you're, if we're speaking straightforward facts, then people who are honest will accept it. And those who are rascals, they will protest. And their rascaldom will be revealed. So if we are going to actually preach the truth, we can expect that some people will get upset. If we're not preaching the truth, then probably people won't get upset. If people never get upset, there's probably something wrong with our preaching. 
if we think that the main aim is that people won't get upset, then we can never preach Krishna consciousness, actually. If we take it as the measure that everyone should like us, then we can't preach Krishna consciousness. We have to speak the truth. And honest people will appreciate it. And most people, in my experience, that yeah, I get into verbal fights, but then uh, fight means there's a tussle, not exactly. It doesn't, I don't often get into situations where it gets very, you know, tense and shouting, sometimes, but not very often. Um, but often there's some, but preaching means fighting. That, that people will say something, you say something, people don't agree. Then you counter it, and they come, you come back. And you, in this way, what is the fight comes out. So, people may get upset. That's their, if we are actually properly situated, then if people get upset, it's their problem. So many people got upset with Prabhupada's preaching. He says something wrong with Prabhupada. Of course, we may say, well, you're not Prabhupada. Yeah, we're not Prabhupada, that's true. But we have to speak the same truth that he spoke. Uh, regarding this topic, at one point a few years ago, I got so fed up with people telling me, I, devotees telling me that I shouldn't speak, speak strongly, that I wrote a long essay with more than 130 quotes, mostly from Prabhupada, also from Bhaktisthan Sastri and Gorky Shah Das Babaji, on why we must speak strongly and if you like, I think that book is there, My Memories of Srila Prabhupada. That essay is in there. If you like, you read it. And then do whatever you like. So that seems to be the end of the questions. And really the purpose of this Krishna Rajya Guru is to chant Hare Krishna, dance and be happy. So please, uh, after hearing all this, don't think that I'm a... I'm a member of an evil organization who's just revealed the truth of my actual position. I'm actually here to exploit you. Of course, it may be true in my case, but most of the leaders of ISKCON are not like that. Uh, so, uh, but we should be intelligent enough also to distinguish what is actual Krishna consciousness from not Krishna consciousness. And... Um, Choose our association carefully and keep our own focus very clear. Hare Krishna. I've written some books. Prabhupada told me to write educational philosophical books. So I'm doing so. I presume if you only not able to write them, but others should read them. So some of them are available here. And some CDs of my lectures are also available just on this table here. If anyone would like to take, please take. It's my main service to call back. So please help me in my service. Hare Krishna. All those to Srila Prabhupada. Tomorrow's lecture is called On Following Srila Prabhupada. What does it mean to follow Prabhupada? We shall discuss this.